All right. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Jane Peck. I'm the Director of Solutions Architecture at Redis Labs. And we have the pleasure of having Scott Haynes from Twilio and Alex Kellinen from Facebook to discuss how they are using Redis in the data science world. Hi, everyone. Um, so Scott and Alex, thank you for joining us today. Um, to start, as an introduction, Scott, what do you do at Twilio? Cool. Um, so at Twilio, I'm a senior principal software engineer, and I work on um, something called Voice Insights, which is uh, telemetry insights and um, like analytics uh, for all of Twilio's voice stack. So for people who don't know about Twilio, Twilio powers uh, communication uh, across the board. If you've ever you know, talked to an Uber driver, Uber Eats driver nowadays, um, it's all being powered uh, through Twilio. Um, and what we do is basically make sure that everything kind of keeps on operating and that we have really kind of simple ways of getting into uh, the underlying data that describes you know, how things are going well and how things are going poorly. So we can quickly self-serve uh, within the actual um, you know, production stack. Being a global uh, company, it's a lot harder to be able to figure out like eyes and ears across you know, thousands and thousands of servers. Um, and then also we have a, a product that's based on the same kind of uh, data that's available for customers to do self-service to have analytics dashboards and to be able to take a look at stuff in like pseudo real time. So things are updated for them in around five minutes time. And then internally we have everything around 250 milliseconds to a second. So wow. it's a pretty substantial stack and it's been fun to work on. Very cool, thank you. And, and Alex, what do you do at Facebook? I work as a machine learning engineer at Facebook, uh, specifically in the ads division. And uh, my day-to-day -day work has uh, kind of a couple of components to it. One is what we call modeling, and that is trying to build better models, uh, improve models, design new models, figure out better use of data. And the second one is the infrastructure. We also build all the infrastructure that we need to run our models in production so that the whole process is fully automated, right? So these days we no longer do like manual model training and deploying it. Once we designed it, it just ships to our underlying infrastructure that we build ourselves, so our systems helped us, and then basically then it uh, runs in production, retrains itself every few days, and delivers you know, best results. So yeah. So in my workshop, I mostly talk about the modeling part, but if we'll get time for the q and I'd love to talk a bit about this productionization cycle too. Very cool, very cool. Now, both of you have created quite an extensive session training people on a deep technical stack. Um, so to give you the opportunity to describe what each, each one of your sessions are get, going to get into, can you uh, give us a little bit more detail, Alex, starting with you about kind of what is the session about and what are the key tech stacks that you'll be covering? Sure. Uh, it's actually quite straightforward. Well, I, I wanted to cover a, a couple of key points in my workshop. And I focused on image recognition specifically, this time with Redis and PyTorch. And what I wanted to show is that, first of all, with today's tools and libraries, we got to such a state that it's actually quite easy to build a pretty complex machine learning image recognition system or pretty much any other machine learning system for any competent engineer. So even though machine learning and AI sounds very abstract and complicated and something to study for years, actually in the workshop, literally in the first 30 minutes, we're going to build end-to-end -end system that reads images from Twitter, recognizes them, and posts responses. And all they're like step by step, so there's like no secret hidden knobs there. People will see exactly what we're doing. So that'll be the first part. And that is the point is that building AI systems today is much, much easier than it might sound. Um, and the second part is I'm actually going to dive a little bit deeper because I also didn't want to leave it as like this is a black box that does something. You put your images in and gives you predictions. Instead, we're going to dive a little bit deeper and actually see there are only two or three key blocks that power modern neural networks. And once you know what those blocks are, it will give you a much higher sense of confidence that you know how the system works and, and what the next steps to take to improve it. And of course, I'll show how to use one of the latest Redis uh, features such as Redis AI to quickly deploy and run your model in production seamlessly. Again, this used to be very difficult to do. Uh, with today's tools, we'll do it like in 15, 20 minutes and it's up on there and running. Alex, you make it sound so easy, but I've gotten a preview of your training session. It's very thorough, but it's not 20, 20, 25, 30 minutes, <laughs> but it's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, multiple sections of 25, 30 minutes. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I meant. Of course, yeah, I don't want to say that it's the whole session, so it's much longer, but people can choose which part they're interested in. Right, it's pretty cool. Um, Concept and Scott Conceptually, it's 25 minutes. Co 
<laughs> right. <laughs> if you were Alex. Um, so Scott, in terms of your session, you're taking a different approach to how you're using Redis for data science. Can you describe a little bit about what your session is about? Yeah, so uh, in my training, um, it's it's following along the same kind of idea of what Alex is doing, um, only it's a, the approach is kind of a slower approach. Um, so the idea is that it's uh, intro to machine learning with Redis and Apache Spark. And so it starts off very, very simple. And it's just how do you get things up and running in Docker and everything else like from the Docker side of things um, basically self-builds uh, an entire environment that has Redis and also has uh, Spark and Zeppelin. Zeppelin's like a UI just like Jupyter. Um, so the first part is just getting the environment up and running. It's like a nine minute video. And most of that is just me talking. So you can skip ahead and just literally run two commands. Um, aside from that, um, we basically go into like a five part series. So part one is like, um, you think about like any 101. It's, I don't know how to use any of the tooling. I've never seen Spark before. And that's okay. So it's how do you load data? How do you prepare data? How do you like mess with data, augment it? And then afterwards, how do you store that in Redis? So the idea is that since Spark is a memory-driven system that performs best in memory, it can also run in disk, but given that Redis is memory as well, they're just showing how to use Redis memory versus Spark memory. So the whole entire session just kind of keeps on building on how to use Redis as the underlying like provider of your data frames. So people familiar with like Pandas data frames or Spark Koalas, which is like the Pandas data frame wrapper, um, it's just a data frames um, solution to machine learning. So it goes through exploratory data analysis, unsupervised machine learning using k-means clustering, and it uh, basically gets into uh, linear and logistic regression as well. And then we end up with uh, basically streaming. So we take our model online um, using Redis streams at the end. And it's, I wouldn't say the fast 30 minutes to learn how everything actually is working, um, but we get there um, uh, at the end of like the, you know, the, the four hours or so from you know, start to finish. Um, but it pretty much encapsulates everything you need to learn in like a six month course. So you can take yeah. your time through every, everything as you go. Um, and just, you know, again, pace yourself with it because there's a lot of content. So same as Alex's, there's a lot of content. You can take your time with it. I, and that's what I appreciate about both of your sessions in that it's very thorough. You're very clear about the instructions you provide and you're walking someone through from the very beginning of Okay, where the data comes in, some of the theory behind how the data is going to get processed, and what the net output is that you want, which I, I like about both of your sessions. So having said this, for people who are new to data science, there's a certain level of intimidation when they go through your sessions because it does involve a pretty deep tech stack. So can you describe your own personal journey of where did you start and how did you come to become this data science expert? And I'll start with you, Scott. Sure. So the journey of discovery that I had uh, kind of is similar to what I show in like the in the workshop. So these training sessions are kind of built off of like mental models kind of built up over the past decade. And for a lot of the stuff, it was like you can use everything as a black box. And Alex also alludes to this as well. A black box is great until you need to tune it. And if you need to tune it, you should then be able to figure out how to tune it. You know, what's that process? And the interesting thing about that is that until you've actually kind of gone through the process of understanding you know, how does the data flow into, you know, the model? What is the model? What's the math behind it? How do the statistics work? Um, until you've kind of broken open that black box, it's really hard to understand things. So mm -hmm. the journey of discovery that I took was, you know, as like a, you know, it's like the detective or whatever else. It's, I'm curious about this. I want to learn more about it. And then how do I kind of, you know, dig into, you know, the, the technology and the different kind of, you know, you know, it's like the peeling back the onion approach. So starting from, you know, really not knowing anything about machine learning about maybe 10, 12 years ago, um, I got really curious about, um, because uh, Tom Segura, uh, not Tom Segura, that's a Canadian. Um, it's Tim Segura. Um, he wrote like a Python book called Collective Intelligence. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was like a really interesting place to get started just because it was, uh, it was just Python. Um, There's no model libraries. Like we weren't bringing in like, you know, scikit-learn or anything else. You just learn how to actually build something from start to finish. And then you get to learn how to, you know, how to models work. How does correlation work? What's clustering? A lot of it is kind of going back to geometry. You know, how do different points on a, you know, on a grid show up in time, you know, time and space? Um, and that was just, it was interesting to me. So I think a lot of this stuff started off as like a curiosity. And then I started actually being able to get paid for it. It made it <laughs> easier to keep on learning. So that was kind of my journey. Um, 
Thank you. And, and Alex, what was your journey like? I actually mentioned it in my uh, introductory clip. So interestingly enough, it began a long time ago initially in the mid to late 90s. Uh, at that time, I was not called machine learning is when I was still at school. Uh, we called it either computational methods or statistics, mm -hmm. and we used sort of the algorithms and even like very, very simple and small neural networks. And I remember from that time, uh, I got a brand new workstation uh, at school, which I was very, very excited. I think I was a Pentium 100 um, processor and maybe 64 megabytes of RAM or 32 megabytes of RAM. That was a lot of, of of power. Of course, it was very small and tiny at the time. So then uh, not much has been happening uh, in terms of the, at least in my experience with the mail for quite some time, but I think things picked up again in early 2010s, uh, 2012, 2013, when again, I think we got uh, a lot of data available to us and computers became uh, fast enough and early GPUs were already used for training and then sort of, uh, uh, I get back to working a lot more with ML and, and image recognition specifically and other algorithms. Um, so talking about complexity, uh, I was listening to Scott and actually want to um, recommend if I were to start learning it now, what I would do is I would pick one area. So again, if it's mm -hmm. an image recognition, that sort of the, my workshop is kind of the, could be the starting point because it touches some key elements and gives you things that work end to end. And then you just start sort of digging deeper in the same area over time, right? So first you build a simple system that works. The next question you ask, like, what happens? How can I improve the accuracy? Then you learn about sort of data augmentation, you know, fine tuning of the models and so on. So you can spend a few months on that and that's perfectly fine. So now I built up your skill set in this area. The next thing you can say, how can I make it even better or kind of make it faster? In this way, bits by bits, you will learn kind of the entire depth of the stack, of a single stack. And then after that, once you feel comfortable with this, you can switch to something else and say, okay, now what about text, right? I want to learn more about text. Or vice versa, you can start with the text first. Maybe it's actually more widely used in many companies, learn a lot about text processing uh, uh, algorithm used there, and then move on to images later. I wouldn't go probably after everything at once because it might be just too, it just, there's a lot of content. There's a lot of content. A lot of material out there, yeah. Right. There is nothing wrong with focusing on one thing at a time. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, people interuse the word ML AI all the time, and they're quite different. So from your perspective, can you clarify to the audience how you would differentiate between ML versus AI? And I'll ask Alex first. No, or is it a, a different very, uh, It's a philosophic, uh, uh, oh. yeah, it's, I think it's a philosophical question at this point. And depending what area you're in, uh, you would hear different meanings. I definitely, when I spend time at startups, uh, they have very different interpretation of these words than if you go to academia. A long time ago, AI used to mean literally what we think about close, like general intelligence, something that, you know, uh, actual thinking machines. Uh, I think this term now blended much more closely with ML, and it's just my, internally, I treat that very close to each other, if not the same. But to be honest, my answer would be look at the context and actually ask the speakers what they mean. Uh, I think in many applications today, they essentially can be used interchangeably. So machine learning, maybe like maybe when you talk about ML, you're talking about something more specific, like particular algorithms. While AI, you just you know basically say anything that it learns from data is now AI. So sorry, I don't have a better answer. It's um, it's very 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 fuzzy terms in my mind at this day. Exactly, and that's why when 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 we're speaking to people about ML AI, you have to dig a little bit deeper into the nuance of what they believe those terms mean. Right. Uh, and Scott, do you have other color into the differentiation yeah. between the two? I mean, it's, it's similar to what Alex is saying. So machine learning systems are good at prediction and they okay. can predict the behavior of a human who's basically encoded the system to think like a human, you know, mm. bringing all the biases and everything else along with, you know, the way that the person who fed the test data and the training data into the uh, actual machine learning system, um, you know, it's, it's all of our own kind of biases and everything else. Like you think about, so, you know, AI is going to be used to predict, you know, whether it's, you know, the next part of a word in a sentence, like when you're in Gmail and you're trying to write and now it's just typing for you for the most part, okay. it's just predicting the next natural word that you're going to say. 
So AI is very good at prediction, but it's not necessarily taking too many actions on your behalf. So you think about like, so Facebook has a good example, right? You know, uh, I guess it's Google. Uh, I don't know if you guys probably have the same thing as well. Um, you know, controlling uh, data, you know, controlling uh, co-location centers, um, you know, control like for heat and everything else um, through AI, because it's faster and it's smarter than a person who's gonna control that temperature. So there's a lot of stuff that can be automated as well. So I think about like AI goes up to the prediction level. And then from there, you know, a system that's decisioning and can basically make an action that a human can't necessarily come back from without basically stopping that control. It's kind of getting into that next kind of realm that a lot of companies aren't going to right now. So it's, I don't know, I, I think about it as a, a system that can predict as AI and uh, it's basically ML or AI and it is interchangeable. And then where it's kind of going as well is just into the realm of being able to kind of take over and control next decisions. Very cool. Now, if we're talking about the futures, do you have uh, some perspectives about where you think this space is going in the next five years? And I'll ask Scott first. Sure. Um, yeah, so next five years, the way that I look at it is that um, we're going to be I mean, everyone's concerned about replacing people with AI. I think AI is going to be used kind of more, you know, as you know, you're, you have calendars and reminders and everything else that's going off right now on your phone. So you don't have to worry about that. I think AI is going to help us replace a lot of the things that are kind of trivial and mundane in our lives. And it's just going to help us focus better on things that we want to do. Um, and I think we're going to get better at, you know, predicting also, you know, a little bit more about human, you know, human behavior. So, you know, if I wake up in the morning and I want to go, you know, grab a coffee or something like that, potentially I might have coffee delivered to my doorstep um, or have, you know, now a connected machine that knows to grind and do a bunch of other stuff. But maybe it will also be ordering beans for me as well. Um, so it's just going to, I think, take over kind of control of like smaller jobs that aren't necessarily life or death, just things that can help you. And if it screws up, that's okay. Cool. Uh, Alex? I will take a bit a different angle on this. So I'm th thinking about as this is a very developer conference. I will uh, talk about what uh, how what implication it has to developers. And this reminded me on when actually I started my career um, a long time ago, uh, again it's in the 90s. And what I did at that time, I uh, wrote a program that connected to the internet website and downloaded basically the page with the images to the local disk. So I found a library that was written in C++ by W3C organization. We barely had any internet at the time. There were barely any websites. So I discovered all that. I wrote this program and I showed it to basically people I was working with. And I hired, get hired on the spot immediately because that was a unique skill. So writing a program that downloads the page was a unique skill in the 90s. Today, I expect my nephew, who is uh, going to be 12 soon, to write the program very soon that does the same thing. So clearly things have changed, which used to be very difficult and hard and kind of exclusive uh, 20 years ago, now we do it without even thinking. So I think that's a direction where ML skill or machine learning expertise is going. Today, it's still a sort of a, a difficult area to master. Uh, there are some people who do it. Most people probably don't do it a whole lot. But I think that 10 years from now, this will become a basic skill that you essentially expect it to have, right? It won't be one under the discussion whether you have basic or at least certain machine learning fundamentals. You can build models, you can build infrastructure. It's a given that you know that, it's just you're going to be tested on how much you know. So I think given connect those two experiences, I think now is a great time to start investing into learning sort of fundamentals. And you can go from either direction, either from bottom up you know, like more like college-like courses or going from top down, uh, get a working system and then start digging into what's underneath and how it works. Because, you know, 10 years from now, I think we'll have to know that. Very cool. Uh, so pivoting along those lines in terms of using new technology and also, you know, leveraging things that, well, converting things that were hard to do and making things easier. How does Redis AI play into it? Because you're using Redis AI, the module, as part of your tech stack for your session. And actually, it's specific to Alex. I think Scott used a different oh, yeah. thing. <laughs> Got it. So I wasn't sure what Scott was using. Yeah, so I used Redis previously quite a bit. I'm actually, uh, I like this uh, piece of software a lot. And what I specifically liked about it, and I think, I hope that Redis uh, keeps this um, personality, if you will, is that in my mind, when people say Redis, 
I think of two things, and it's not necessarily database related, right? but two things are fast and scales really well. I think like uh, if you, uh, as long as things fall under this umbrella, I think Redis will have a great future and it's going to be a very exciting tool to use. So it started as a database, right? It's a fast database. It scales really well horizontally. You add extra boxes or instances, however you work with it, and you get more capacity. Redis AI is a, is a you can think about it as a module, but to me, it's almost like a different piece of Redis ecosystem, right? And as long as it does the same thing, it works fast, and it scales horizontally. I think that's it, which is what it does, I assume, today. It's, it's a very excited tool, tool to use. I also know there are more things in the pipeline, uh, and maybe we'll have time to maybe add something tomorrow during the Q&A session, uh, and next year, piece called Redis Gears, which has sort of the same promise capabilities. So I think, uh, you know, fast and scales, and uh, it, this, this tool makes it really, really easy to do new different things. So it's no longer a database, it's now a, a model uh, runtime, right? And you can add more pieces on top of that. Got it. And considering the fact that you're using Redis AI as part of your tech stack, um, what advantage do you find that it adds by using Redis and AI as part of the inference process? That's so I think, the, yeah, I think uh, the key part here is the infrastructure deployment and integration of database, I right? Uh, ultimately, I can write the inference code myself that runs pretty much in any environment. Mm -hmm. But by itself, it's not very interesting because what you want is you want to be able to deploy it really quickly, uh, 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 scaled horizontally, because one thing you can be assured of, if your product works, and people come, or your you know your usage increases, you're going to need a lot more capacity right. than you know. It's the more the better. So the ability of scaling, I think, is critical. Mm -hmm. And of course, fast. And that is uh, Redis AI is optimized to run on whatever hardware available to you. Which is if you got CPUs, it will use CPUs efficiently. If you got GPUs on the same box. Uh, it will use GPUs efficiently. In fact, you might even deploy Redis uh, just for the Redis AI module to the infrastructure you would you would not have considered previously, right? Just because you can run your inference module there really fast and scale it seamlessly. Uh, so I think that part, plus the integration with the remainder of the Redis database, I think these are very, very attractive features that make things easy to use. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Um, now, Scott, you're using Redis in a different way. Can you describe a little bit about how you're using Redis as part of your you know, session stack? Yeah, so um, in a lot of in a lot of machine learning um, like applications, um, if you consider like the the data engineering uh, pipeline side of things, it's what data code what what data is fed into a system to be enhanced and then changed uh, through feature engineering for machine learning models. That whole entire process requires the ability to be able to um, really uh, rely on uh, data that's uh, been kind of uh, transposed in a specific way. So um, the underlying Redis uh, data sets right now, uh, the Redis table from the Spark Redis uh, connector is using hashes. So the hash map itself um, has the ability to basically have, you know, uh, it's named columns and rows. So it actually fits the data frame model really, really well, but it allows you to access everything in memory. So instead of having to load everything to disk and then uh, kind of scan across uh, each individual row and column to extract out data, you're just selecting exactly what you want. So it's kind of like Parquet, but it's not loading from disk, it's already in memory. Um, so it's actually interesting because the same operation that might take, say, you know, 30 seconds to a minute um, through Spark uh, running off of something like HDFS takes something like three to seven milliseconds like from Redis. So it speeds wow. up these pipelines a lot more. So if you think about like embracing real time, Redis helps with real time really, really, really well. And a lot of real time problems are many, many, many small, you know, problems solved over time versus like batch, which is going to take in, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data to kind of collect, you know, maybe, you know, maybe to rerun, you know, an offline model and then put it back online again. But a lot of events, like in an event stream, are bytes of data. Um, and then you basically intuit more information about that by going back to Redis and then, you know, collecting more information from, you know, Redis as a database to kind of generate like a new view of that uh, un underlying data. Um, so I use it more as a way of really, really quickly manipulating data on the fly, and then also having a reliable set of data to go back to. So if you think about training, you know, training a model, testing a model, storing all that data in Redis means that I don't have to worry about that going away. So it's always in its own spot as long as it's been versioned and not written over. 
Um, so I'm using it more as like the, you know, it's a trustworthy, reliable um, source of data for training models. Now, you're, always, you're also using Redis streams yep. as part of a trigger mechanism. Can you describe a little bit about how that workflow looks like? Yeah. So, um, so for Redis streams themselves, um, for people who are familiar with like sorted sets and, you know, timestamps as like, you know, the value or the score for a sorted set, a Redis stream is kind of similar in that it uh, takes basically, you know, any data. Um, it can be binary data. It can actually be uh, data that's going to be going into kind of like a hash, uh, a hash map object. And then that ends up being uh, kind of like an unbounded stream, or you can actually bound that stream of data. You say, okay, I want to basically trim the length to a million records. And then as long as your system can kind of process, you know, up to a million records at a time, or if it only wants to be able to backtrack a million uh, records, it gives you like a reliable kind of pub sub mechanism, which is mm -hmm. kind of better than like the traditional pub sub from Redis as well. So right. uh, it's kind of more of like, it's more like Kafka at that point. So you have consumer groups, you can, you know, uh, cluster your approach to actually reading all of that data. So you can scale horizontally with, you know, the data as it's, you know, as it's coming through in real time. Um, but the stream itself, the mechanism for triggering to your original question, is literally just adding, you know, a way to trigger something. So um, in the training that I have, it's triggered based off of a Netflix show ID. Oh, so cool. the show ID is like the, you know, it's a unique identifier. And all, all the system takes is a unique identifier. Then that's reading that in real time. All it does is go to Redis to get more information about that Netflix movie. And then it runs that through uh, like an actual uh, serialized model that's been deserialized back into uh, Spark. And then it will tell you whether or not something is kid safe or not. So it's just basically telling you, is it kid safe or not? Um, it's a simple, like, simple application in machine learning, but there's no decision tree or anything else that we've built manually. Um, okay. It's all just been trained uh, through that training. So different right. kind of use case and just used as a trigger. So. And the people who are going to take or go through your sessions, they'll have hands-on way to actually experience and see how to leverage Redis streams as well as the Redis hash structures as yep. part of Spark, right? Yep. Very cool. That's, that's, that's correct. Um, Gentlemen, thank you very much. For everyone on the call, please go and attend both Scott and Alex's sessions. They're, very, they're wonderful, they're very deep, and you'll learn a lot through their sessions. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, have a good day. Bye guys. Bye-bye.